Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod episode 53. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante this week. We're extracting the signal from the noise. We break down the top stories we're tracking, events we're going to, and of course, the hottest news in technology and in the enterprise, which is mainly cloud AI and everything around open source and data. So much going on, funding, announcements to you know, big news going around the internet. Dave, great to see you. Uh, hey, John. Week, week one of the next year of the pod. Um, we had completed a full year and now are on to year two and uh, great audience developed, not huge numbers, but like no, big numbers, but still not huge numbers, not in the top 10 of podcasts, but getting a nice kernel of elite enterprise technologists who are really doing deep tech. So I got to say the results so far from the podcast, we did it every week. I think we missed one week because of travel or holidays, but pretty much a full year, Caden. So um, this year we up our game on our packaging and, and get our format tweaked, but great, great year. Great. Year yeah. We're getting good, good feedback. You know, people seem to like it, listen to, I, and I love it. It's a good, good. I get good John time once a week. <laughs> well, we had, uh, we had great feedback last night. I did a, uh, an event in, uh, Palo Alto, a networking event put on by Mindshare PR plug for, uh, Heather, uh, Simmons. And we had a great, great cast. We had, uh, Shujata Banjurji. She is a, um, a VP. She would have been an SVP under VMware, but VP of VMware Labs, part of Broadcom. Nima Beatty, who's at uh, NVIDIA, Cube, Cube friend, and uh, Ehab uh, Tarizi, who's the Senior Vice President at Dell Technology Core, working on all the system stuff around AI. And and boy, was the turnout amazing. Founder of OCP. I'm sorry. The oh, CEO, really? The CEO of OCP was the Open, Open Compute Project. Um, and just a great conversation. And they're all, they're all loving the pod. They're like, they're all like builders. And they're all loving the little nuggets. So shout is out. Ehab, to, is he Ehab? He came on at MWC. He was a great guest. Yeah. yeah. He, he's, he's, done, he's deep tech. Well, the thing is, is that what's going on is, is that there's a lot of infrastructure going on that's going to enable the AI applications. And I was there. Chris Priesmark Berger was there from um, Newstack and Ray, Ray Wang was there. Um, just a ton of great people. And uh, it was just fun to see. The networking on the vibe of like dot com kind of vibe or web 2.0 when the magical moments of discovery and entrepreneurs and builders and it's not just young gen z's it's, there's senior people too on their third fourth startup uh multi-exited entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and vcs all at nola's in palo alto and uh like i said you know we the, the pot is getting some good traction and the feedback is you know, get more structured and get some guests. <laughs> like, Chris oh, we'll is work, at, we'll uh, work on that. Chris is at uh new stack now. I didn't know that. Or maybe I did know that he's, he's good. Doing, he's doing he's really a good bunch. He's, I think he's working for like three or four publications, but great to see him. Um, and you were in New York, um, yeah, doing a so tour, I, uh, the NYSE and you had the Amazon event. Yeah, I had. So Matt Wood, who's the vice president of Amazon's AI <clears throat> gave us, you know, his overview of, 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 of their AI strategy. And then we met with a bunch of other leaders, guys in financial services, guys across industry. We got demos, we got robot demos. It was very cool. And, um, and then, yeah, I was at NYSE. I spent time with their head of technology, mm -hmm. um, met with him for about 45 minutes, which was really interesting. Uh, got a tour of the facility. Um, you know, saw, saw what's going on down there. Sp Spent some time, did a little pilot mm -hmm. with those guys and their yeah. TV setup. So that was yeah. good. It was great, actually. Well, I put a little teaser out there on Facebook and LinkedIn. And so it got massive viral buzz. People were like, what's going on with the NYSC? Had our logo all over the, the floor. People thought we went public. I'm not going to go public. Maybe, yeah, right. Um, but there is, there is going to be a New York cube. And that's just a matter of time. We're looking at final details there. But we'll be partnering with NYSC and others. What was cool yeah. was we when when they flashed the Silicon Angle logo. If you haven't seen it, go to John or my Twitter. They flashed the logos. Silicon Angle logos were on like every station. You know how they have the trading stations. Yeah, yeah. So they had it was like a cube, and then all four sides of the cube or three sides of the you know whatever the the the, the shape had yeah. Silicon Angle red logo on there. And we were up where they ring the bell. And you could just see out over the yeah. show floor or the the yeah. stock exchange floor. It was it was pretty cool. Great publicity too. All the background CNBC sets down there. So having the cube on the New York Stock Exchange floor will be a great addition. Hope to pull that off and other and all the VCs down there too are reaching out as well. So I think we're gonna have a great um, 
set up in New York. And there's, you know, this the media landscape has changed. I talked to the head of IBM uh, Media on this and a bunch of other folks here in, in the East, when they're on the West Coast. IDC had their uh, big event here. Um, the, there's a there's a real need for deep tech analysis on business, the impact of business. And, you know, leaders that are in our network, the CEOs that we talk to every day uh, and and check in with, Love the fact that we talk about the impact of the earnings and and the and the stock price from a technology perspective, not just from sales. And I think that is a, a need. And I was just on the phone with IBM covering their master's application that they're launching uh, the new features with, and even more and more analytics are coming into the sports side of things. And so the real tech audience wants the deep tech, and I think that's going to be a nice complement to the New York scene where we have a lot of financial analysts who read our stuff. And, and do watch our videos come on the cube and are in our community. So I think this intersection of financial technology, deep tech, and you saw that at NVIDIA Day, but their GTC event, you had a deep tech conference. I mean, the hardcore developer conference, you had financial Wall Street-like crowd coming in, the financial analysts coming in, really unpacking, because I think the competitive advantage for the financial side is going to be getting on the right wave and connecting the dots and the smart money is going deep tech and getting in the weeds and really digging in to the technology so shifts. Back back in the day when I started the uh, Wall Street service with Alexa McClellan, who was he's hired her out of Goldman when I was at IDC. So back then, the sell side analysts, now remember the sell side analysts, they print the reports that the, the hedge funds read. And then the hope is that they trade through the firm. So Goldman Sachs will write a report or... You know, UBS will write a report, and the hope is that the fidelities of the world will then make trades through the the idea generator. But back then, the Wall Street analysts, the the sell side analysts, they could actually get paid on investment banking deals. It was the mother of all conflicts of interest. So you could take a company public, and then the sell side analyst was incented essentially to write good things about the company. So really, really huge conflict of interest. And so the SEC said, wait, wait, wait that's got to stop. So I can't remember exactly when. It was like sometime early 2000s, probably like around Enron. You know? And so what happened was after that, and, and by the way, the sell side analysts would make bank because they were, you know, they were making it up at the back end. You remember Mary Meeker? I mean, she's still around and she was like a rock star analyst and, uh, John Levinson from Goldman Sachs and 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 a number of folks that just made a lot of dough with that little, you know, wink, wink. So the SEC blew it away. And then what happened was the sell side analysts all of a sudden became like spreadsheet jockeys, right? And so almost like they lost their interest in in like deep tech. And so it became watered down for the for a long time. What's happened now is, you know, Wall Street making a lot of dough and they've started to properly fund these sell side analysts and the sell side analysts are getting really good. A lot of them kind of left over from those days that have, you know, now have wisdom and a lot of new names that really understand tech. And so they've reduced, they've eliminated that conflict of interest. So now a sell side analyst has no incentive other than, you know, they like the stock. And so, but, but I've known, you saw it at the Broadcom mm -hmm. session. I mean, those guys were, they know their stuff and it's, they're, they're really good. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them are really, really good. So the deep between sales, the sell side, just for the folks listening, sell side is the folks who are sort of the unbiased opinion of a company based upon proprietary research of the company's security. So basically, they're supposed to be independent. Um, yeah, yeah. The and, and, I, and the and, buy, I think, and the buy side are much more about getting the story right, selling to hedge funds, getting to the alpha, whatever they do. I mean, I mean, they explain the buy side. Yeah, so buy side is making bets. They're like, yeah. those are the people who actually <laughs> trade the stocks, right? So, uh, yeah. and so, so the, the sell side, you know, their incentive is to write good research, do good research so that, you know, they call make good calls. Yeah. And then the buy side is obviously that's their jobs depend on it. Both sides depend on it, but the buy side is the ones who makes the bets. They're the hedge funds. So, so the sell side, sell side of the folks are the ones that you see on TV. The ones that you see, like on CNBC, they have the analysts, quote analysts, that are supposed to give a, 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 a an independent opinion from uh, on the stock and, and the company. Um, and that day, we, as we talked, I saw some analysts on CNBC. I won't name names. In run the in our our industry knows who they are. They're basically, oh, Intel's got a tailwind. Meanwhile, they just lost seven billion dollars. 
So there's a real problem with analysts on the sell side right now. Not yeah, being, so it's like not being tainted, but there's a there's a you know a challenge. Uh, if you're going to be an independent analyst, you're going to be on TV. You better be independent. And if you're getting paid by Intel to say good things about Intel, and and then a week later they lose money, you're obviously not a research analyst. You're not a sell side analyst because because you're obviously being paid by the company. So there's a real problem with um, analysts. You mentioned IPOs that was solved by the SEC. But in the industry analyst community, there's a, there's a similar problem going on now with, with this whole so-called independent analyst on TV um, should have an unbiased opinion based upon research, not if they're getting paid. It's coming back again in our industry. This has been a big controversy, Dave, and we've been we've been seeing it. Yeah, so you're right on on the sell side. So guys like Tony Sakanagi, you might have seen him. He's Bernstein. He goes on TV all the time. He's really, really good. Aaron Rakers, I don't think he goes on TV, but he's a really good analyst with Wells. The B of A semiconductor analyst is really, really good. There's a lot of really good ones. And they, you know, they've they really study tech and they go, they go deep. Yeah. Um, it was so it's it's been an interesting transition to watch. We used to have two Goldman Sachs analysts inside of IDC. We had like a two million dollar deal with Goldman. It was an exclusive. We couldn't <laughs> sell to any other sell side mm -hmm. firms. And then after the 87 stock market crash. They, they canceled the deal. And so I started the service with Alexa. We hired her out of Goldman and then we crushed it. IDC today has a great. Well, there's, uh, and there's business. also, there's also uh, explain the difference between a financial analyst and an industry analyst. Cause I think yeah, it's so, important for, cause I yeah, was so, referring to the industry analyst on TV saying. Analyst. Yeah. So, right. That's right. Similar so, model though. Independent. Well, well, financial analyst is certified. You know, they have a CF, most of them have a CFA, a certified financial analyst. And they're really. You know they're they're qualified. They've they've been certified, and their job is to pick stocks basically and make calls. And they're usually really really good writers. They, like I said, where they're increasingly um, they're increasingly uh, technical uh, because they got to be. This is a technical business that we're in. Whereas you know the industry analysts are like you know Gartner, Forrester, IDC. They tend not to be really in tune. With the financials, it's funny. I mean, I love going to financial analyst conferences because I think that, you know, frankly, I think financial analysts are smarter than industry analysts. No offense to my industry analyst colleagues, but but in fairness to industry analysts, industry analysts care much more about product and getting deep into, you know, the the business of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say that business. They care more about like go to market type stuff and just kind of things that are less financially oriented, um, and so they tend not to care about income statements and balance sheets, which of course I care a lot about, but, um, At the end of the anyway. day, it comes, it comes down to transparency. So, so New York's hot. Tell us about your Amazon. You went down there. I saw Matt Wood on LinkedIn posted some really good, uh, commentary. Um, he went down talked to the media, talked to the analysts. You were there for an NDA discussion with AWS and Matt Wood talk about AI. Was that NDA or can you talk about that? Or can I can not? talk about it, but there was a lot of NDA on there, but I can talk about it. And so it, first of thing, first thing is it was pouring sideways when I got there. I drive to New York because I, you know, the weather sometimes holds up like Andy Tarai flight got canceled, couldn't get in. And uh, so he was kind of bummed, but there were a lot of local New York analysts there. Um, there was a couple of people from Gartner. Uh, Doug Henschen was there from Constellation. He's a really good analyst. And a number of other folks as well. Um, it was probably only like, I don't know, 10, 10 analysts. And so Matt Wood kicked things off with, he basically was only there for an hour, but he took us through like a bunch of slides. He had this seven, it was seven or eight point, he called it a journey or steps, he called it, steps on you know AI adoption. It really wasn't like linear steps, um, but he took us through that, like started with training and then he made a big deal out of uh, out of out of security and privacy, which they're obviously you know, was, AWS has always been focused on 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 security and privacy designed in, and of course it was timely. They didn't bring it up, they didn't bring up that um, that report. Did you see this? I, I, just a quick aside: the review of su the summer 2023 Microsoft Exchange online intrusion from the China uh, hackers. Yeah, um, I did see that. So that was, they didn't. That was... they, they didn't bring it up. They should have. I mean, maybe it was in side conversations, but they know they that, were cool. That was that's nothing to do with Amazon. That was Microsoft. I know, but 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 they didn't bring it up because. But but in a way, I brought it up in my breaking analysis because, I mean, if you're a CIO or if you're a CEO and you're relying on Microsoft, and you read this report, you're like, whoa. Okay, just to clarify, because there's a little non sequitur there, the Cyber Safety Review Board damned issued a damning report Tuesday, on on last summer's discovery 
on Microsoft's breach. That was that was the survey, and and basically revealed a wide wide conspiracy between the Chinese government and uh, other people, and they got sensitive yeah. auth authentication key and broke into Microsoft's managed accounts to steal massive sensitive information from the U.S. government, and, and, and they got they just basically got hammered. They got taken to the woodshed. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go to no, 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 first, stay, but, but it's, stay it's, on it. it's relevant because, okay, so it's, it's, it's unbelievable, John. Well, uh, explain, let me, let me, because explain what you held okay. up. Because so I, in 2023, I'll explain there was what, a, what, 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 what it is in your whole yeah, in, in, in 2023, there was a hack, um, from Chinese, it was linked to Chinese actors. Yeah, but, but you're holding actors. in your hand, you're holding I know, your hand I'm going to explain it. Okay. I'm going to explain it. It was linked to Chinese state actors. And then the the U.S. government found out about it. It wasn't even Microsoft that found out. They had alert Microsoft. So the U.S. government was like, "WTF? We have to look into this." So the Cyber Safety Review Board was was asked by the the Secretary of Homeland Security to do a deep dive on this. So they published this back in late March. And I'll just give you a couple of poll quotes that I pulled out. By the way, by the way, we reported that I reported on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, and and and, they, and Silicon Angle wrote it up fr Friday at four o'clock or something. They they announced it in November. Remember that they said yes, it was like this last possible they did minute. Such a poor the, job. No, they they tried to sneak it on Friday before the weekend. It was they got eviscerated for that. Yeah. So they, look at this poll quote. Quote: The board finds that this intrusion intrusion was preventable and should never have occurred. The board also concludes that Microsoft's security culture was inadequate and requires an overhaul. And then the second pull quote, throughout this review, the board identified a series of Microsoft operational and strategic decisions that collectively point to a corporate culture that deprioritized both enterprise security investments and rigorous risk management. And then the third takeaway was they cited best practice cloud examples that were kind of exemplary from Google, Amazon, and Oracle cloud infrastructure. And then they had a bunch of contributions from some other people. But, but so the reason I brought it up is because if you're a CEO a board member, a CIO, a CISO, a P&L manager, and you're running your business on Microsoft, I would be like, whoa, time out. And we're betting our, our AI business on Microsoft? Hang on. We're at risk. And the this report just eviscerated them and said they yeah. still haven't figured out what happened, why it happened, and they really didn't come clean for a long, long time. And so that should be a real cause for concern and, you know, AWS, to their credit, they didn't really hammer on that. They just said, hey, we're focused on security. We designed it in. They, I think they did a good job of, of explaining that. It's funny to me that Charles Fitzy, he's always crapping on Amazon, you know, for like, you see him this week, like searching for a compression algorithm or experience for AI. He's always crapping on Amazon because, you know, they're maybe behind the, uh, the, the, the race in AI. But he doesn't even bring this up. I mean, to me, this is the number one biggest concern is security. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, this is really Microsoft putting their head in the sand. The other, the other, there's so, there's so much backstory. But if you if you zoom out for a minute, okay, not and, and look at Microsoft, they hired Charlie Bell away from Amazon in 2021. It was a big move. He was supposed to be the right hand to Andy Jassy, heir apparent, um, and. And then they had this whole initiative of this secure future initiative that they were going to Im implement, and they did. Nothing really happened. So they're getting killed inside the industry by people throwing a lot of darts at them saying, hey, you guys, you know, you're supposed to implement this new thing, and it just didn't work. Now, the thing that's interesting about this report that came out, again, we reported that the, the, the minute it happened, we, we were like calling them out immediately. So we were all over it. The customers didn't have all the facts, so nobody knew. They hid the ball. And what was even worse is... They knew about it, okay? So they actually knew about it for um, long before. So again, the government doesn't trust Microsoft. So they, they issued a huge thing. Now, remember, we reported back in 2013 that Amazon won the deal with the CIA. So this is a huge setback for the cloud at Microsoft. Azure okay. team, you got to be really looking at this and saying, "Look, at you, this is a major, major, major setback." And and if I'm if I'm Microsoft and I'm, I'm Amazon, I mean, if I'm Amazon, I'm like, "Look, at, we won the CIA. We have a Gov Cloud. Microsoft's foray into in, into public sector just isn't working." So that's going to be really, really interesting to see. Um, and, and to your point about the pull quote, they just don't have the corporate uh, practices according to the government. But I got to tell you, this uh, C CSRB, which is the entity that gave that report um they are not happy and then they really they was very much uh, um a threat 
and they knew and they knew about it. The other thing that comes up is that OpenAI now has these co-pilots. So I, I don't know if you remember, but when well, they had Microsoft Ignite, I was hanging around the Seattle Westin trying to get some stories from some folks there. And I overheard many security people saying, we are turning off Copilot because they were launching it with default on. So I reported is, that too, John. This, this is going to be a breaking this analysis. Is gonna, this is going to be a huge blowback for Microsoft. So, it, you know, micro, I'm surprised Amazon's not jumping on this because it said, they're getting I, well, killed I mean, by they, OpenAI uh, and Microsoft. They were, well, I know. Well, I want to talk about that in a second too, but said Microsoft's failure to detect compromise of its cryptographic crown jewels on its own, relying instead on a customer. The customer was the government to reach out to identify anomalies. It got, it, 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 it compromised the email accounts of the Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, U.S. State, uh, United States Ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Nicholas Burns, and Congressman Don Bacon. Can you imagine the e private emails talking about China? I mean, just it's just really incredible. Okay. And then, and then, wait, one more thing. However, by the conclusion of this report, this review, Microsoft was still unable to demonstrate to this board that it knew how Storm 0558, that's the 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 actors, had obtained a 2016. MSA key, 2016 technology, and they were using, they were doing manually, manual updates to it. They hadn't even automated it. I mean, just really, really bad. No, no best practice. I mean, so, the, wow. The, the report basically slammed them for dragging their heels and, 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 um, but, and, but John. and, and, and delaying because they, 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 they publicly tried to bury this thing. And, and the thing that killed them on this one, the experts already knew of the war was sounding, sounding the bell, alarm bells on this. And, you know, this is the hackers getting into the government email accounts managed by Microsoft. So, you know, it's like unbelievable. So I think this can be, again, back, back to the setback with open AI, giving Microsoft a huge cloud burst in the market share numbers in the, in, in the, in the, the vibe of the market, this is going to be a setback on the public sector. And I think Amazon's CIA deal in the gov cloud will reap the benefits from this. But John, but here's the thing. If you look at the data, the spending data from, from our partners at ETR, OpenAI, OpenAI is the number one company in the whole survey, 1,800 IT decision makers. OpenAI is number one in terms of spending momentum on their platform, the percent of customers that are spending more, net customers. Yeah. It's like off the charts. And then Microsoft is like right there with them. Like yeah. they are off the charts. And then, but I will, I'll give you some other data points. Anthropic is rocketing. Doesn't have the presence, doesn't have as many, you know, response, the responses in the survey, not nearly as many as open AI. Databricks is also rocketing. Yeah. And the other thing is Google and AWS are actually coming together. You know, I've reported for years on the cloud spending and AWS and Microsoft are by far the, the, the leaders in cloud spend in terms of the customer momentum, but in AI, Google and, Micro and, and Amazon are coming together while Microsoft and OpenAI are like running away with it. So the po my point is that it's, it's despite these reports like this, they're still kicking butt and it's a real risk. And I think, I think CEOs need to step back and CIOs and say, hang on, we have to do some risk assessment here. Cause this is bad, bad, bad. The, um, the, uh, Dion, Hinchcliffe from Constellation has got a survey going on around business uses. What, 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 and the question is, what is the primary LLM that you use today for your work, work in business? Chat GPT, 41%, 41.7%. Cloud, which is the cloud family, that's, which is Anthropic, 25%. Gemini, 16. Mistral, Llama, not registering up even under, under one, basically zero so, on the chart. So, so, so it's so, interesting to see that. So let me give you some some others like metrics here. So net score is the net percentage of customers. Basically, what percent who's spending more? Who's but what percent of customers spending more than less? You subtract the lesses from the mores and you get a net score. OpenAI is at eighty percent. So saying eighty percent of customers are spending more, and and if, out of out of a survey of eighteen hundred, five hundred and fifty five are saying we're using OpenAI, compared to Anthropic, seventy seven percent, seventy six percent. Net score, a huge net score, by the way. Anything over 40% is great, but only 89 responses. Microsoft, 74% with 611. So you combine Microsoft and OpenAI, it's over 1,000 out of, out of 1,800. Databricks, 69% with 209. And then Metalama, 
60%, very strong, but only 87, so not as popular. AWS, 58% with 370, and Google, 56% with 340. And then, so all kind of coming together with uh, with this. But the other thing is, Meta was ahead of Anthropic and Databricks last quarter. They flipped. Anthropic and Databricks are now ahead in terms of spending momentum. And then there's other guys like, you know, Oracle and IBM are in the chart. You know, not as much momentum, but they got a you know, pretty big presence in the marketplace. So the race is on, John. I have a question for you. I want to I want to run something by you, something sure. that I heard from Matt Wood. Yeah. Um, yeah sure. he, he kept talking about how model optionality and diversity is an advantage. And you know how a lot of people are saying that LLMs are just going to get commoditized? You hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So I asked him, I said, well, wait a minute. A lot of people think LLMs are going to get commoditized. Where do you stand on that? And he said, definitively, no, I don't believe that at all. That model diversity, right tool for right job. And we're going to play off of these other models. We're going to use models to train other models. And that's going to create, he didn't use this term, but essentially implied that's going to create a moat for Amazon. I was like, hmm. And then I was on another call, same day, with the head of strategy at a very large company, a uh, tech company. And I asked that individual, what do you think about LMs? He goes, you know, I've been around a long time, used to be a VC, I do a lot of strategy work. I think they're gonna get commoditized. Uh, VC so, gave it away, he's the wrong answer. Never ask, a, like, VC, never ask a VC about a trend, ever. If you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> well, if, you're you're an entrepreneur if you're an entrepreneur listening to this, if, never ask a VC for advice. Because they're, 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 not, they're not entrepreneurial. Well, what do you think though? What do you think? Do you Absolutely think that LLMs gonna are gonna no, get commoditized? Never, no way. No, so Amazon, no, Amazon's no. assumption, you you believe is correct. Yeah, they'll look at the models are just the beginning of the new substrate of how the new architecture is rolling. There is so much change going on in this market with AI and the infrastructure layer with data. Everything's changing. Databases aren't. Um, Tesla's not even using data databases to train their thing. They use video. They're using video uh, images. Uh, we talked about that last night on the panel. All computer science. Um, Tools and mechanisms are going to radically change. The, all the all the um, sacred cows of computer science will will evolve to the new 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 normal, which is going to be AI infrastructure. Again, we talked about this last night at our Palo Alto meetup. Too bad it wasn't recorded. LLM, I have some data on L, that, LL, LL, LLM and foundation models will be a long tail power law, which we publish. So if you look up the long tail of um, uh, LLM, you'll see it. That's what's going to happen. Is API is going to connect the world. I'll continue to do that. LLMs will integrate with each other. They're going to talk to each other. They're going to have um, mechanisms for interacting, data interacting with each other. And that's going to be the new model. And that's why the commoditization is not going to happen. It's going to be a value market, meaning whatever LLMs have value, other LLMs will seek them out and integrate with them for better value. So the combination of fusing data sets will be the model. And and absolutely will not be considered because a small model could be very valuable. If, if the, the data is valuable, <laughs> data is only valuable in the eye of the beholder who wants to use it. So what does even that mean? It's going to get commoditized. Now, if you're going to argue anything, you can argue that open AI is going to get commoditized because it's vanilla. If you index the the entire web, you're never going to be accurate in areas. So some areas you're not going to be accurate, hence hallucinations. So what's going to happen? It'll interact with other models. Smaller models will interact with larger models. So the power law just represents the size and scope or domain specific of the model. So now you're hearing specialty models. What does that mean? That means the data is specialized around something. And that's what enterprises are going to have the value. So, I wanna, so that that's where the value is. It's going to be in the I, data and the workflow. So so just like a just like is let's take let's take an example. I I went out I went out on on a, uh, on detail last night on this. Let's take a semiconductor example. Is ARM a foundry? No, no. They design the chip, and then ship it to Taiwan. So in they actually AI, they actually don't even do that. They just have the software framework, and then they give it to designers who then they give it to designers design it to a standard, and then ship it to TSM. Okay, so the thing is so tight. It's yeah, like hold on, they're getting, hold on. let they're me let the me tape let, out in like let, rapid time. Let, let me finish. And arms are about models. our arms were and Broadcom models. Broadcom does the same thing. So they design and then they they get someone in a foundry to build it. In AI, what's happening is. 
the people who design the value, the combination of the workflows or data could actually design a winning interaction and then ship it to say a foundry using quotes, meaning some sort of centralized compute farm, training farm, inference farm, reinforced learning farm, neural network, knowledge graphs. There will be someone like a cloud player or a hyperscale, maybe meta, who will be processing and you can process it on the hyperscale clouds, on premise or edge, the compute side will gonna, is going to get really, really robust there. So the value is going to come from designing AI. And so people could use AI. So you, do you build AI yourself or do you use AI? So that's really going to be the distinction. So Matt Wood is accurate on that. I would say that he's absolutely correct. Like models will not commoditize because what does that even mean? Commoditize? Well, it's okay. So that's part one. Well, what, what it means is that the value is going to flow up the stack and that's what a lot of people want to believe. But, but the, the second part of that question is, okay, well, if Matt Wood is correct, that models won't get uh, commoditized, let's assume he's correct. And that becomes a key criterion model optionality. Will other competitors to AWS be able to, match that. In other words, last year at Ignite, Microsoft announced, I think some stuff with Cohere and, you know, a couple of, I forget who, but, oh. and I remember it tweeting out, well, okay, so they're, they're adding optionality. Will they be able to do so in a way that competes effectively with AWS or will AWS be able to build that's a right, moat? It's the wrong question. The wrong, the wrong, the wrong, it's, well, the, but it's, it's a question. I mean, I'm sorry. It's here, a question. Here's the, here's how I would flip it. You can't say it's moving up the stack. I mean, being commoditized or abstracted away are two different things. Okay, you can have commodity means comes comes across as no value or or a, sw a low switching. Well, that's cost. what they're saying. They're low saying low, low they're switching saying cost. Low switching costs race to yeah. zero. Well, depends on you know the, how valuable the model is. So again, some if if you're going to be obsolete, let's just say a, a model like OpenAI or, or or Mistral, if they stop innovating or doing working on their model, they'll become obsolete. Right. So, in fact, I introduced a new term last night on the panel called tech obsolescence, not tech debt, because if you have technical debt and you go out of business, you're dead. So there's no there's no debt because it's irrelevant. So so you can be irrelevant and be commoditized by not keeping up. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a changing landscape, lang change, trying to keeping trying to catch up and stay ahead. And there some are say are losing ground. So what's happening is it's moving so fast. You, you stop being commoditized. You're being beaten. So commoditization is 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 a whole nother conversation. By the way, I'm but, not I'm not defending the commoditization. No, no, no. I'm just I'm just trying to explain my thoughts the because, theory. because abstracting away the complexity is not a bad thing. If the models are valuable for the application, which is the top of the stack, that's where the value is. So the question is, the question of moving up the stack is about the application getting value. That's data and infrastructure cap capabilities, compute, uh, big iron performance, um, low latency real time. So as that infrastructure gets tooled, which is, is being done now, that's the bottleneck right now is infrastructure. Um, so uh, I think the commodity conversation is more about who stays ahead. So it's not being commoditized, it's becoming competitive. Well, and these guys are yeah, investing like, like crazy. I mean, now, it's now, like- Now, Fitzgerald so. pointed out on Platform Economics today, Platform on his blog, that, that um, Anthropic is in bed with Amazon, obviously, with their alternative to open AI. He's reporting that some people are telling him that um, they're working on a competing version. Dude, that friggin' report came out last November. He's making it sound like he has some inside baseball. That's like yeah. old news. Yeah. Olympus, explain, right? Olympus ex came out. Ex explain. And, so Olympus, I think Reuters broke the story last November, like mid-November, I don't know, Thanksgiving, that uh, AWS was working on a new uh, foundation model that was, you know, world-class, two trillion parameters, I want to say, called Olympus and that their objective was to surpass Anthropic. I'm like, okay, he's making it sound like, like it's such a, like, the, oh, they don't care about Anthropic. I, like, well, no, that's just classic AWS. They did the same thing with Graviton and, and they're doing the same thing with their, their silicon chips. They're just bar raisers. That's what Amazon does. So it's not either or with Amazon. It's like, oh, Snowflake or Redshift. Yes. You know, so that is just a misunderstanding of, of, of AWS, but having to, to comment on so many earlier comments, that abstraction layer, you know, Amazon's never been really that great at those abstraction layers. And that's what Q is supposed to be. And, and Matt Wood kind of laid that out, you know, Q is supposed to be the easy button. Um, and I think 
they're, they're trying to apply it, like queue for supply chain, queue for data, connectors to to Jira and ServiceNow and Slack. And so it's going to be interesting to see, John, will they actually build those apps for them for for, for the people who don't want to build them themselves, or will they allow yeah. their ecosystem to do it? And I think again, the answer is yes, both. I mean, I mean, it's no brainer that I mean Amazon has to have their own model at some point. Uh, well, they I, do. They have Titan, well, but people say Titan's meh. You know, it's like, but well, they, of course, acor according to Alex Heath at The Verge, he's reporting that uh, in his post uh, on the end of March, March 29th, um, Amazon has um, Rohit Prasad aggressively performing goals to beat. Yeah, uh, he's he's the Alexa guy. He's well, he a, he's a, he was the head of Alexa who Jassy said you're reporting to me let's fix this. Yeah, he he's he's a, he's running their AGI group. Yeah, now, which that, is right, it, which it is may, so it he may not, it may not be AWS, it might be Amazon because Amazon uses uh, AI in all their products. I think just, you're right, John. Not just I think, AWS. Well, you know Jassy better than anybody. I think Jassy said, "Hey, I got to <laughs> this is too important. You're going to report to me." I I think that's the guy, yeah. the guy you're talking about used to run Alexa and Jassy he reports to Jassy now. Well, I mean, I was talking about this last night. I'm going to get. I want to get your thoughts on this riff here. I want to riff on something for a second. So last night I was talking to someone talking about the 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 meetup we were at. All these AI experts and uh, and the panel AI experts in the audience. And one of them was like, "Hey, so it's really exciting seeing everyone's talking about pitching their companies. There's a lot of activity, entrepreneurial activity, and um, a lot of a lot of comparisons to the dot com bubble. You think it's going to burst? And I did, I pulled your line. Yeah, it's going to burst at some point. When I don't know. I have no idea, but it'll burst." And I said, it's a good, it's a real good bubble though. It's a good bubble. I said, not a bad bubble. And then we started getting onto AI and who's the, going to be the winners and losers. And I said, if you remember the web, the internet web days, there were web pages and search engines and you had DNS, which ran everything that was government funded by the department of commerce. And it was, a, it was like a public utility, the domain name system, which is what the URLs were based out of. If you think about the web and AI as a, as a, as, a, as an example, the, the comparison to the, the the World Wide Web early days and and AI, there's some similarities. You use the web if you were a business you, by building web pages, and you had to do that. You had to handcraft HTML, get a domain name, host it, put content on it, and people could browse it and use the website and do stuff, browse for information, and then ultimately buy a product or do something, navigate to some 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 content. And that was an easy way to use the internet. Then you had search engines like Alta Vista, and then Google came along, which were harder to do. So with AI, it's a similar thing we're seeing. People are using AI like RAG and uh, retrieval augmentation generation, using AI to, for chatbots, co-pilots, agents, all changing the game on the interface side. And then you have other players building real hardcore shit like Microsoft, like Amazon. And that's the distinction. Are you building AI, which means you got to hire specialty talent they all probably make it 300 grand a year and getting poached by every other company you gotta have real intellectual property in algorithms and hardcore deep tech that's hard so you're going to have suppliers of ai to users who are going to use ai so if you think about it that's going to be a very interesting dynamic david what do you what do you think about that because in a way we have ai for the cube but we're not building machine learning algorithms and, and all kind. we're using ai tools right so we're like the web page so, so the, what the web page was was you took advantage of the technology so there's yeah. users and buyers and people are trying to figure out where they go and it's okay to be a user because there's benefits there and so data and workflows that you could use and get value so you think about the role of aws and i'll put google there not just microsoft scares the crap out of me now after this was reading this report um but like one of the things that i learned this week and it's so true. You'll appreciate this. He's, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was Matt Wood. I think it was Matt Wood. Uh, he said, you know, it's not the greatest analogy of the world, but it's like Swiss cheese. Uh, what do you mean? Well, the data corpus is like Swiss cheese. When you would build AI and you build a rag, for example, when there's data there, it's actually pretty good. But the problem is when there's no data there, it's like this big hole. And so what the rag does is the AI will start grabbing from different pieces and make stuff up. And so what you have to do is figure out either how to, you know, fill those holes or how not, not to go into those holes. And so that's the kind of thing that AWS does and they do it really well. The other thing that I learned, he said that a lot of times these models, they're really good at the beginning 
and then they have a u shape quality curve and they get kind of crappy and then over time they get maybe better he said we're flattening that curve and that's that's their role they're they're like hardcore technologists so secure it you know make it better give me tools so that i can apply it to my own corpus of data like we've been talking about on the power law of gen ai power law of gen ai is t- completely playing out you see it everywhere so i gotta ask you something john it's kind of related to what you're talking about for your meetup i, I want to get this out there i've been meaning to to put this out in the cube pod i've been holding it since march i i have a friend <laughs> who's been like, holding you've been holding it in yeah but I, I just haven't got around to it i have a friend who's like deep inside ai like three letter agencies and like a, you know, a handful of ai experts in the world and he's one of them like you know that maybe is a hundred that are like this guy so and he's really down on full self-driving has been forever he's like what tesla has is bullshit it's like uh so he's always been saying that now of course i don't really know i'm like yeah, i'm excited about full self-driving but okay so back in march when tesla i was reading about tesla scrapping its old full self-driving code rewritten the stack and becoming a learning system this is this 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 person's that their thing is all it's got to be a learning system why do we not let kids drive until 16 years old because they learn organically you know their brains mature but all of a sudden we're going to get you know full self-driving not going to happen so i i send this note by a text and say i don't really understand you know if this is going to work he said this is what i was explaining to you when the last time we talked and what they needed to do the way they were doing it was amateurish it was just a band-aid and then then he said I've been pushing the rope with them, meaning Tesla and others, to get them to do this for quite a while. But I'd like to see a new sensor architecture. But so far, they know better. And so I'm going to put this out there. And if, I don't really understand it, but I'm I'm hoping that either you do or somebody in the community does. He said their sensor mapping and spatial reconstruction are human perception-based instead of machine perception-based. That's wrong and will give inherent bias to any data analysis so not truly 100% adaptive or heuristic. Not to sound heady, but building a machine perception system is beyond most people's understanding, much less capability. So I said, meaning Tesla's ingesting and analyzing human driver video to train the AI. My understanding, this is a step up from hard coding a series of if this, then do that in C++. But you're saying this is still adequate. I said, look, for example, he's talking down to me, when using sensor data to reconstruct, say, a room, the sensor data has anomalies that are somewhat sensor-specific. Typical sensor systems change, in quotes, the data to fit a human perception of what it should look like. For example, straight walls, square corners. But anytime you change data, you lose fidelity. So if you're creating an adaptive heuristic learning system, I've been preaching, it is better to let the learning happen with unprocessed data, not with data change to fit the human perception. He's like, again, talking down to me, you getting this or do we need a whiteboard? <laughs> and I said, I thought this new Tesla approach in just actual you should video. Have said, you should have said, get a whiteboard. I wait, 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 I'm going to next time I'm in town. And I said, but I thought this new Tesla approach in just actual video and has the AI to quote, figure it out. And are you saying the Tesla sensors are providing associated metadata that has changed to fit the human perception? And he just sent back a smiley face, whiteboard needed. Son. <laughs> so anyway, I caught, you know, I, I didn't catch it. Right. I didn't, I obviously didn't, didn't grok what he was saying, but I get it out there, but I'm hoping that you or somebody in the community who's got, you know, more technical depth can yeah. explain, but I'm going to go do the whiteboard session and it's really hard, get deep. It's hard to, hard to grok specifically the way you read that. But I would say that what I, the conversation we had last night with some of the folks in the room who were under NDA with Tesla is how they're getting the data is not conventional data. It's not like your classic database. So they are feeding video into it to train the video. And that there's a lot of AI agent technology being built. And 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 this came up a lot. Agent Cockcroft was there actually. I saw him again. He and I were talking about how agents are being used in infrastructure. So the whole AI AI ops field is changing. What and so the gen back to Tesla and and as, as an example to other environments is a complete changeover is happening with AI in the sense that with agents, with AI agents, the ability, not just chatbots, it's like agents that can understand data. Repeat, repeated processes, identify patterns, you know, and look at these kinds of things. 
and then take action is is and, and generate a response based upon something else is is so new and compelling but but the the challenge is, is that before generative ai code was written to fill the gap for those things meaning like we had to build mechanisms in software to handle to manage things to be real time and do things with generative with ai agents you can actually make the agents work on behalf of things that were built for the for wrong reasons so those other things that were built pre generative can be disabled because generative agent ai agent will take care of it if the agent's good so so if you build the right agents how to manage data ingestion, looking at certain processes that are repeating themselves. I mean, trivial example would be like a, 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 a bunch of help desk tickets. I want to kind of, I can, I can, after a while, you pretty much know what you're going to see. You get formats and you can come in, you can train some, an agent to fix those. You can look at things like microservices and cloud, for instance, and say, you know, we don't need some of those things we had to build before because we now have agents who can do those things and generate things on the fly and keep things in smaller controlled areas. And it's better management. So you'll see things that were built for reasons prior to generative AI that need, will have to go away because we don't need them anymore because an agent will handle it. So that's the big conversation that we've been having in some of these tech circles is what are those mechanisms that are no longer needed for, for the generative AI generation. And I think that's just like to go to the web example. I don't need to go to the library anymore. I can just, just go to a web page. So the library okay. is irrelevant to me. So so there's going to be things that will go away because they don't we're not needed anymore. Or so I buy that. Not, not, not convenient. So, so I buy that. What I what I would say to that is in order for that to happen, this system of agency, if you will, taking action, you it, you you've got to have a, a proper data foundation. I'm, you know, it sounds like bromide, but, but you do. So I think behind that vision that you just laid out has to be some kind of fabric and a knowledge graph that has access to coherent and unified metadata. That's not like hidden to use an Amazon example, because I know Amazon better, but they've got metadata that's stuck in glue. They have other metadata that's stuck in data zone and, and data zones that they understand this. Mm -hmm. But to be able to surface that in real time and be able to take action on it, this is why we always use Uber for the enterprise because Uber basically had to write its own software to do this, to make all these different disparate data elements coherent so that you can take trusted action. Because which data do you trust? Which data is are people actually have access to? Do they have a, Some people have access to that data. Well, it's kind of the same data over here, but it's in a different format. Which one do I use? So that's a really hard problem. But I think the vision that you're laying out is the future data platform, when we talk about the six data platform, it has that element uh, as part of it. It's a yeah. system of agency. So yeah. it's a it's a great vision. And I think it's actually going to happen within the next five years. Uh, we'll see. I mean, we'll track all this. The, the great thing about it is um, I was saying to the folks last night at the panel and and, uh, and other people in the industry this week that it's a great time to be covering technology. And that's why I'm excited about the New York expansion for the Cube is because there's such a thirst and appetite for technology, deep tech impact. Companies need help right now to move the needle on their business. They need real research. They need real advice. They need real consultative approach. That's why Accenture is doing so well. So we're in the picks and shovel stages of AI, but problematically, the developer community is so going crazy with demand. It's the infrastructure that's slowing everything down. And there's a huge debate about this. And I'm definitely hardcore on this because there's no doubt in my mind from what I see, the problem with AI right now is the infrastructure is just not there yet to fully turn the, move the needle in a big way. The activity on the developer side is booming. The solutions are coming online. You're seeing things hit. The, the activity of building stuff with AI, using AI is off the charts. The rag stuff and the retrieval stuff, co-pilots and chatbots, it's proof points that people are using their data and their knowledge of their workflows to write software and use AI to scale it. At, at lower cost, maybe what took 100 people now does 10, what took 10 now takes one. So like the, the human involvement to, to manage it is changing. So that activity is off the charts and scaling fast. The underlying infrastructure is the problem. The GPUs, how much is it going to cost? What do I stand up? I mean, the edge is non-existent. There's nothing on the edge right now. So, so again, this is a huge opportunity for the Dells, the Hewlett Package of the world, uh, Amazon. I even think Meta will be a major supplier in this. So 
Google. IBM too. Google. IBM's, the, IBM's the other one I'm excited about. I'm, I've been ex I haven't been excited about IBM stock in I don't know ten years. But IBM they... IBM is perfectly positioned. I mean, IBM is I won't say got lucky, but they're you know so you hang around the the, the basket, you're going to get a rebound. In this case, IBM got a big rebound. They've been doing Watson for over a decade. Now it's prime time. They got all that DNA and muscle in consulting. They got business transformation and they got this Switzerland position where because they don't have a cloud and they have kind of everything else, they can actually be the monster connector of all the other stuff. So I won't call them an integrator, but they can just be a great solution provider to everyone and, and bring technology to the table. So well, they can, so they're going to sell got, Watson X to, they're, they're going to, they're going to provide Watson X to a lot of different companies. So, yeah, I mean, I think, and, I, and, I, and Red Hat on the operations side. So cloud think, native goes mainstream with Watson X. It's a, it's a great combo. So they got so, play at, at the Adobe conference last week, the Adobe summit. And, um, and, and, but, but I guess my point being, I think the AI trade is going to expand beyond. I think it already is beyond just the picks and shovels. I mean, obviously, co-pilots are an example, but I think, you know, Adobe with Firefly, I think ServiceNow, Salesforce, even though, you know, it's not really, I don't know, it's like lightweight AI, but still, I think these big software suppliers are going to going to do really well. And I mean, I think anybody with an install base and a brain and some resources is going to do really well with, <laughs> with AI. Yeah. Well, speaking of AI, I heard that Amazon is doing great on the compute side. Obviously, they're getting um, their teeth kicked in by, by open AI in the market perception. And I think they're going to catch up to them in, in a way. So that, But they're still kicking ass on as a cloud provider on the IS side, in, infrastructure side. Azure, obviously, the security breach that you pointed out is a really black eye for them. But on the compute side and Google on the compute side, I'm hearing people talking about this big time that they can't get the compute that they need. So I'm telling you right now, there's a cold chill going through the industry right now from developers and people trying to scale up AI. I need horsepower. I need compute. And that's why I think there's going to be a surge for servers again, clustered systems, AI systems. So again, I was talking about this with Dell and HPE again all past the month that you're going to see a massive surge in server sales. Why? Because people are building the new AI clusters, spine and leaf built into mega systems. It's all going to come together. So a whole nother data center architecture wave is coming back, not because cloud's irrelevant. It's that cloud operations now supports data centers for AI horsepower. So right. the cloud guys have to get their, their act together and to provide the compute and GPUs. Otherwise, an NVIDIA will step up to the table, a core we will step up to the table, or a Grok has the inference engine will step up to the table. So that, you're going to see a lot of action, Dave, on, on well, this. And next week at Google Cloud, we're going to unpack all this. Let me ask you this. So Matt Wood said, it was really strong statement he's like look we were the first to ship h100s we have 400 instances ec2 instances we will be the first to ship blackwell you know so we're really making that point strongly but you remember we attended that uh luncheon with vast that was hosted by vast at gtc mm -hmm. yep. with the genesis cloud so i i, I for my breaking analysis i wanted because vast is kicking ass amongst those um alternative clouds those gpu clouds so I, I I reached out to Vast. I said, "Can you give me a list of those guys? Because I don't have them at the top of my head." So Genesis Cloud um, was the one that we met. But there's Core 42, Core Weave, Lambda, uh, Nebel, um, and I'm sure there's others. They're raising tons of money. What do you think about those alternative GPU clouds? I think that's huge. I talked about this a year and a half ago. We call that tier two clouds. Remember, we called it the cloud. Yep. The cloud uh, power law is going to. You think they're up. all going to make it though? There's a lot of them out there. Well, I'll tell you why the demand's so high. So first of all, I think there's a was we're in a secure uh, not security a scarcity crunch with GPU. So one, having a managed service with some sort of elastic front end to it, whether it's pay as you go, managing costs, is going to do well for for any company that's got that because right now the demand for GPUs are high. And until the horsepower comes on premise where people can build their own clusters, you're going to see managed services being used. To the extent that someone can't get compute or GPU from Amazon, Azure, or Google, they're going to go to CoreWeave. Or if they got a better price, they're going to go there if they're price sensitive and not locked into the cloud, aka using the stacks of services, say, at AWS. So that's, that's that. I think Matt Wood and Amazon are going to absolutely get it right. In the history, if we look back on history, I think the bet that Amazon's making is we will never yield on our ability to deliver infrastructure as a service. 
everything that's come out of reInvent in the past three years has been leading up to this moment where Chick Custom Silicon is leading the way and they have the horsepower to do it both on training and inference. They might look like they're fumbling with them at the LLM level with Bedrock, but I think they're just setting the table and know that no matter what anyone does, the game will be determined in the later innings. And I think that's going to be a play from Amazon. Google is trying to catch up to stay in the game, but if they can't get compute, that's going to hurt Google. So I think Google's doing really well right now. They just got to get their act together on some of these SLAs from what I'm hearing in the field. So, and they're doing good. So they're, you know, again, Gemini, I think will be embedded in people got to, people are, are trash in Gemini, but there's uptake. So I had I mean, um, all it was was a launch that the press freaked out on over some, you know, some bad data, which is understandable. But, you know, they could have done a better job. I'm not defending Google. I'm just saying that you don't judge them on that. You judge them on, on how fast they can stand up the models and who's using it. And can they deliver compute? And that's going to be that's going to be Google. So uh, clearly, Dave, this is going to be the end game. The later uh, innings I, will determine the winner in this in this game. I, ha I have another source. Uh, I can't, uh, it's anonymous source, but, but I met with this individual in New York city. We had, we had drinks at the bar <laughs> and I was picking his brain on, I mean, he, he, they're like deep into tech, pretty big AWS account, but they, they do Google. And I was asking about Microsoft and open AI. He goes, I, I won't go near it. He goes, I go, well, we use it. It's a better product actually. He goes, I, I won't touch it. Won't touch and, what? Uh, open AI. He goes, Nope, Nope. Don't trust it. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I can't put my stuff into, I can't use it. I just, it's banned in my company. We we're we're big bedrock believers. I said, what about Google? He goes, Google, he shakes his head. He goes, they got the best tech. He goes, they just don't know how to sell. He goes, they don't know how to service me, but their tech's unbelievable. So he's big. He's an Amazon shop number one and you know, Google for AI stuff. And so that's kind of interesting. Well, I mean, I mean, um, that is, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a problem for Curry and George Curry. And they, they have had challenges building all the infrastructure for their business operations. I mean, Google's sometimes their own worst enemy from what I can see, they got a great tech that, but their, their discipline has always been big, big back end, not a lot of front end, you know, classic Google search kind of philosophy. But they've been trying over the years. It's just, it's just it's not over an overnight success. You just snap your fingers and you got instant sales operations, reporting, field operations, full go to market. Um, it's hard. It's not easy. Easy. I mean, if anyone can do it, someone from an Oracle background like Curian. Um, yeah, but you know, think about that the the task he had. I mean, when Diane Green was there, she got the product stuff together, um, but it was just too much product. Up, up leveling and too much business operations. Amazon's a well-oiled machine compared to Google. Well, Microsoft, I'm probably sure it has the best operational go-to-market stuff because they've got DNA in the enterprise for years and decades. So I would say Microsoft's probably got the best machinery from, from the customer standpoint. Uh, Amazon, number two, Google, number three. And if you put Oracle in the mix, I'd put them at one or two because Oracle's a well-oiled machine when it comes to sales and marketing. I, 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 I'm so disappointed with Microsoft. I mean, I've been so high on them because the, the data just says they're, how much they're kicking ass. But then again, just reading this report, I'm just, it freaked me out. We got to talk about Intel. Can well, we? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, like I said earlier, I, I was really kind of, you know, seeing people on TV just a week ago. Oh my God, Intel's tailwind. They're going to be great. Oh my yeah. God. After and that then, foundry, after yeah. the foundry, like brouhaha. Yeah. So they, this, the, the stat is they, 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 you know, to their credit, they're going to split out the foundry business from, you know, the design business. And they, they said they had a last year, $5.2 billion operating loss or two years ago. And now last year was 7 billion loss on 19 billion in revenue. And they're saying break even is three years out. And they want to have 40% gross margins by 2030. I mean, it just underscores what a hard and really crappy business the foundry business is, uh, but it's strategically important. Yeah. Lawyer texted me, John, because you know where he stands on ARM and Intel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, Qualcomm X Elite WinArm chip seems to have found a lot of favor with PC makers, boasting 75 trillion operations per second, double exclamation point in red. IDC's PC forecast is plus 2%. Therefore, x86 volume has to be declining. The only way volume 
to get Intel to volume is to take very large ARM orders away from Samsung and TSMC. And you got TSMC, obviously, the gold standard. Samsung just upped its investment in that Taylor, Texas plant to $44 billion. And, you know, you look at Intel, the vast majority of its foundry business, if not all of its foundry business, is internal captive. And he, <laughs> it's like, so unless they can take huge orders away from Samsung and TSMC, which is a very low probability, they can't get to volume, which means they can't get to cost. They can't get to yields. And so, again, I, I asked the question, if, if de-risking the supply chain for, for the, the, the United States, for its critical infrastructure, is the objective, yeah. would, it, would it perhaps be better to invest in TSM and Samsung, who are way further along? Samsung, you know, says it's going to be profitable now. You know, it's, it's had a couple of tough quarters, but, um, but the big investments, they're going to 10x their operating profit, I just read. Would it be better just to invest in them and, and say, you know, look, Intel, go, go design. Who needs Intel for Foundry? I mean, I, I, that's a bit, this is an important question that I want to unpack. It's like taboo. But is the important criterion, John, that it's manufactured in the United States, or does it have to be a U.S. based a U.S. company? Like Toyota has 140,000 employees in the United States, so that's I think a question that has to be asked. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough question. I, I think first of all, found you you brought this up last pod. Found whether it's Intel Foundry or um, uh, TSMC, it does it it has to be someone in America. I think America should have some foundry, but um, the government bailing out Intel is not the answer. Intel's hemorrhaging, right? So again, the 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 question is is twofold. Foundries are needed. You got to build chips. That's that's a nat I do think that's a national security challenge. I do agree with that. Don't like the bailout. I don't think Intel might have been a good call there, but you know, Intel's already like seeing massive financial hemorrhaging on this. And Bernstein's piling on too. They're down 13 already down 13%, one of the biggest shareholders. So so Intel's licking their wounds. So the, the bailout thing bothers me with the government. I think they could have maybe looked at a different scenario. That that thing's just a subsidy. Subsidies don't work. And I'm not a subsidy fan of subsidy. You got to have a turnaround plan with real meat on the bone. So that's one. Number two, you don't know what you don't know. For example, the market on, on semiconductors, for the people who know about semiconductors, and and this is something that you got to be really careful of. If you're going to be an analyst. You got to get get it right, not just say you know got no business being on TV saying Intel is going to be a great company, and then then they just crash and burn. You shouldn't even be invited back. But if you look at the financials of the semis, the AI and allocation optimization is going to be critical because you have a supply chain problem. This is the key business problem. Where you got you got to deliver the chips, and the foundries are going to be backlogged. So you can design all the chips you want. So there's a need for foundry. The question is, it takes too much time to ramp them up. So this is a tough call. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, Qualcomm, Broadcom, they're all building ships. They all got to have supply constraints. Um, you know, I mean, you get, if you get the allocation right, you're going to have a good numbers. Cause if you just shift, if you know, the margin, you can manage the supply chain. And the demand Hist orders. And so, uh, I don't know, Dave, it's just like. <laughs> I mean, history shows that number one in the market, in a big market, does really well. Number two does okay. Number three essentially fails. I mean, we're seeing that in cloud. And cloud's big enough and Google's got enough other business that it can sort of hide, you know, it's, it's deficient cloud business compared to the other two. But yeah. it's, it's a classic case. You see it in so many markets. And. If, if, if Intel can't become like a viable number two surpassing Samsung, but Samsung has to keep up with Apple and it's got way, it's got light years of experience in building advanced chips. And yeah. so not light years, but I mean, it's a, it's a well ahead. So I think, I think realistically, it, it, at least Pat is realistic. Like I'm not going to catch TSM. I can maybe be number two, but if he doesn't get to number two, it's going to be just a pouring money down a sinkhole. And that's really, I've, I've said it before, Intel could go bankrupt, but the only reason, the only way they won't go bankrupt is subsidies. Uh, and I'm 
I, I think you got to ask the question: Is that the right use of taxpayer and, money? And also, also, also they all, also they make like take Qualcomm for instance. Qualcomm has many different like platforms of chips, so the allocation of the resource to the different chips matter too, right? So uh, it's just it's just it's a tough game. Um, we'll see. I mean, these. I mean, we we in talking to the Broadcom folks and Intel folks over the years and Qualcomm. The semi guys know the business. I mean, they're in the hardware game. Everything's about turn, next cycle, next rent, next improvement, moving the the units out there and being ready for the next generation. So we'll see. Um, and again, Intel, we'll get to keep an eye on those guys. Continue to keep an eye on it. The, the the good news, Dave, we got it. We got everything right, and we're not even getting access to Intel. So you know, Intel is not really embracing the industry. Uh, engaging the industry analysts on this because I think they're just trying to feed the market uh, PR. So it's it's interesting to see Intel's uh, analyst relations strategy around this. I it's mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, again, Lawyer has been on this since 2011 when PC volumes peak. It had a huge influence on me because he educated me on this stuff. And you know, we're doing another, we're doing a breaking analysis uh, this month to unpack NVIDIA. Obviously, we'll talk about Intel, ARM, alternative uh, 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 XPUs. He's he's somewhat down on the chiplets, as you know. I've been testing that, but I think there's a real market for it, so I'm going to push him on that. And I think he thinks that the the edge opens up a lot of opportunities for specialized processors and and and, and XPUs. So that's going to be fun. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, let's we're getting down to the end here. I want to put a quick note out there. We're going to be at Google Next. Um, next week, Google Next is their cloud event. What's interesting, Dave, about this is, is that Google Next is they just had their event and then they moved it up this year to make sure it's in in Vegas this year, not not San Francisco. Again, one of the companies that are moving moving the event out of San Francisco because of all the the issues there. But we have a great lineup. We got we have um, a ton of leaders in the ecosystem: McKinsey, Accenture, Automation Anywhere, um, Quantify, Elastic. Deloitte, Google execs coming on, top top execs coming on, um, PwC. We have ARM coming in, person SVP of infrastructure coming in from ARM. So nice. we're talking about, talk about semiconductors. We've got ARM coming on. We're going to have um, ACL coming on. We're going to um, – and a bunch of CUBE alumni. And we're going to have um, um, Joe T. Banzi, who's the CEO, founder of Harness, who's also a VC. We got um, the chief product officer from Box coming on. Uh, Diego Dugakin, and we got um, the CTO, field CTO of Databricks, Gabe Monroy, uh, developer experience VP at Google Cloud. Bobby Allen's coming on. We're going to have a whole day dedicated to analysts. We're going to have five segments um, dedicated to analyst angles. Oh, plural. nice. Uh, analyst Cube. angles, plural, with an S. So, Cube Collective, folks. So the, the Cube Collective, our open uh, United Artists of Analysts, United Analyst model, is coming together nicely. We're going to have... Um, Actually, three dedicated segments to non-cube research analysts, and of course, we'll have our cube research analyst angle on there too. So you're going to see a lot of um, great sponsored content coming out from some of the best leaders. We're going to get extract their their stories and share them. But this, we're going to have great cube editorial and reporting and an analysts coming on. So awesome! Google Next should be great. And of course, this month we got SAS, and then next month Red Hat Summit, Boomy World. I got two kids graduate from college. RSA, Dell Tech <laughs> All World, Alter Rex, Dell Tech World, IBM Think, IBM Informatica Think. World, Memorial Day. Dave, it's going to be summer. And it's going to be like what the hell just happened? I know. <laughs> hey, uh, just a quick. I want a quick hit. Rubric uh, filed for IPO, and they're going on the NYSE. Um, and. It doesn't look great on paper, but I think it's actually yeah. fine. Uh, they have $6.3 billion valuation. They're losing money, but it's because they're transitioning from a perpetual model to an ARR model. Their ARR business, subscription business, growing like crazy. And so I, I actually think they're going to do really well. And I think, you know, we're going to be interested to see if Databricks goes, if Arctic Wolf goes, and then maybe eventually Cohesity, which, by the way, um, speaking of Arctic Wolf, we're going to have um, uh, RSA is coming up as well. Yeah, and, um, and by the way, we've got, we got official word now that at RSA, the Monday, we're having an event. Uh, we're hosting an event um, with New York Stock Exchange and Intel Capital uh, and, and uh, some two other companies with us who are going to be hosting an event, uh, Open Policy, Intel Capital, and waiting here for a few others. The Cube will be headlining a party, invite only, 
Uh, it's going to be at Lamar in San Francisco, the Monday happy hour from five to seven. If you're going to RSA conference and you're going to be there, send me and Dave a note or one of us a note, and we will send you a link to sign up for a special VIP happy hour. If you're a you know company scaling up in the security space, got some generative AI technology, we'd love to talk to you, have you sit and mingle with the Cube event. So great to have uh, these happy hours, Dave. This is going to be, usually we go to the happy hours. Now we're having our own. That's going to be awesome, John. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for over an hour. Now, a good wrap here. Again, wow, Google yeah. Google Next is going to be great next week. It's going to be. It's going to be. I'm, I'm expecting to see massive amounts of AI announcements. But we'll be squinting through those announcements. We're going to ask some questions about the infrastructure. Uh, we're going to have Mr. Loheimer back on. You know, he's awesome. He's former VMware Dave. Um, and we're going to have um, all the infrastructure guys coming on as well. So um, we're going to we're going to get him. We're going to get the stories. So. See, right. you, see you next time. Thanks for right. listening. That's Thanks, Q Pod 53. Thanks for listening.